Hi. Uh, if you're not asleep already, <laughs> you can join us in the next talk. I am Parul, and with me you have Krishna. Uh, we are going to talk about how you can empower the efficiency of your clusters by using power-aware Kubernetes scheduling. So we've had too many AI and LLM sessions. This is a good refresher for you, and stay with us. So first, who we are. We are open source contributors that are working on cloud-native sustainability stack. And the major contribution comes from IBM, Intel, and Red Hat. Any Intel folks here? No, we have few IBMers. And any Red Hatters? OK. So at the cornerstone, we have the project Kepler which gives you energy observability metrics of your cluster. And around Kepler, we have other projects that we are using to consume those observability metrics to do cluster optimization. Kepler is a CNCF sandbox project already. And feel free to drop at a kiosk on Friday, 10.30 to 12.30, if you want to know more about Kepler. But today, we are talking about peaks which uses Kepler observability data to do energy and power-aware Kubernetes scheduling. So what problem are we trying to solve? Well, we all know that, the, I'm not sure if all know, like anybody familiar with Kubernetes scheduling framework? Okay, <laughs> so like Kubernetes scheduling framework gives you the provision to have your inbuilt or like custom scheduler plugin that you just hook up with the uh, scheduling framework and you can uh, optimize or you can try to solve whatever problem you're solving in the scheduling or whatever objectives you are uh, trying to maximize or minimize. But within the ecosystem, we found that there's a lack of scheduler plugins that focuses on uh, power optimization or energy effic efficiency while also taking care of the other objectives that they are trying to solve. So uh, we thought of developing Peaks that can address this gap. And what Peaks does, it, it essentially try, tries to maximize the energy efficiency of your cluster while also focusing or letting you do other stuffs uh, like how to optimize on topology and how to optimize on network, uh, network or CPU utilization. So our goal was to come up with a configurable scheduling plugin that minimized the aggregate power consumption of the entire cluster. And we wanted to implement it as a score plugin while making sure that we are not altering the default scoring plugin uh, of the Kubernetes framework. So the solution, obviously, Peaks. We've been just talked about Peaks for so long. So uh, Peaks is a Kubernetes scheduler plugin that aims to optimize the aggregate power consumption of your entire cluster. And the important thing to note over here is during scheduling. So it at the moment, Peaks only do uh, this optimization at pod placement. And it uses pre-trained machine learning model that correlates node utilization with power consumption to predict the most suitable node for your workloads. And these predictions are based on the resource need of the incoming workloads and the real-time utilization of the nodes. So, Let's go over Peak's workflow, and this is quite going to be very descriptive, so stay with me. Uh, we'll start with what happens or the pre-processing we need per scheduling cycle. So we start with taking a node in your cluster, and you have all the nodes that you have in your cluster. You extract some metrics. Right now, we are using energy consumption metrics that comes from Kepler. And we use usage, node usage metrics that comes from uh, node exporter or load watcher. But the thing to note over here is you can bring your own metric provider. It doesn't really matter what metric provider you're using, as long as that metric provider push the metrics into Prometheus. And you can read from Prometheus uh, the energy consumption and the node utilization metrics. 
So for each of the node, you will have these metrics, and then you will create a node power model, which is a function of node utilization, node energy consumption, and the workload request that your pod has. So you train a machine learning model for each of the node within the cluster. The next step is you have an incoming workload and the pod has its resource requirement that can be read from the manifest. So uh, now this processing is done per node. So what you do is you consider a cluster node and its power model. So you have a node, you have the power model. You try to uh, predict what is going to be the change in the node's instantaneous power if you schedule this pod on this node. And you, whatever is the change in the node's instantaneous power is what is returned as the plugin score. So you do this for all the nodes in your cluster. If you have more nodes, you just repeat this process. If no, then you just go towards normalizing the plugin score. So over here, we have given a basic normalization function, but essentially what it does, that it gives higher score for nodes with has less change in power. And once you have uh, the normalized plugging scoring done, then you can put a suitable weight for the peaks plugging. And weight is essentially, Kubernetes let you assign a weight to the plugin, and depending on the weight, uh, the, the priority or the importance is given to that particular plugin. So uh, once you have the weights, you have the score, you just, uh, this whole cycle will give you a node that is best fitted for the pod. Uh, if it, uh, and you decide that by the highest normalized score. So if you have more pods to place, you just repeat this process. If not, then your cluster, that's, that's really happens. You will always have more workload. So <laughs> let's talk about the power model training and inferencing. So each node will have run some benchmarks and this is like a screenshot of all, we were using stress NG for this particular experiment. So we ran a lot of benchmark. We uh, overutilized 100% utilization of all the node. We collected the metrics, the particular metrics we were focused on was CP utilization and power consumption. And using those metrics, you generate your node power profile. And inside the pre plugin, you, you import the model power parameters, and once you have the pod, you get the resource requirement of the pod, you get the node uh, model parameters from the model, and then you predict the best node for that particular pod. And the prerequisite for this was a metric provider. As I said, you can bring your own metric provider as long as they push the metrics into Prometheus. We used Kepler and node exporter. You can also bring your own model. Like it doesn't really matter how you have trained your model as long as we can use that model. So uh, the training is outside the scope of Peaks, but when we were creating this, we have a training pipeline, but it doesn't matter how you train your model. Peaks just uses those model to the uh, inferencing. So the important thing to note is you, you can train your model depending on your cluster behavior. So if you have like AI specific, uh, workloads, then you can create the model according to the AI. If you have edge specific, so you will consider those parameters in your model training and you'll have edge specific uh, node model. So next we have experiments and Krishna will give you an overview. Yeah, thanks Parul. <clears throat> so we have gone through the what peaks is till now. Uh, I would like to take you through the value of peaks, how you can realize actually the value of peaks so that we all can appreciate the work, right? So uh, before I jump into the um, different use cases, uh, uh, let me also first explain you briefly about the experimental setup that we have. Uh, so it's a two node cluster that we have considered for the evaluation of uh, uh, peaks uh, performance. And uh, uh, we considered in particular a bare metal cluster, Kubernetes cluster with two nodes. Uh, these nodes being heterogeneous in nature. What heterogeneous here refers to is uh, the resources allocated to these uh, uh, 
uh, nodes are uh, uh, not exactly the same, right? So one is a uh, high power machine, one is a low power machine. You can see the uh, CPU cores varies from 8 to 40 and also the memory allocated is very high in this node. And, uh, uh, and then we uh, run the benchmark workloads and uh, fit the, uh, uh, try to capture the uh, node's power behavior. And these curves represent the uh, node's power behavior. The uh, one in blue is for the uh, node one, and the one in uh, orange here is for node two. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, the the power curves actually depict two things. One is uh, they consume some power even when the node is uh, uh, almost not utilized, right? Even in the ideal state, they consume some power. And the power consumed, the ideal power is uh, very high for the high power node and uh, low for the low power node. And also during the active phase as well, the amount of uh, power consumed by the high power node is very high. So this we can uh, look at this from this graph. And uh, uh, with this, you can actually uh, uh, relatively rank these uh, nodes, one being the more efficient node, the low power uh, node is more efficient, the high power node is the uh, less efficient, uh, right? Uh, another important uh, uh, aspect is that, uh, as I said, uh, some of the use cases uh, we uh, go through to realize the value of uh, PX plugin. Um, uh, this is the scheme of evaluation, right? We uh, first <coughs> uh, run some workloads using the Kubernetes default uh, scheduler. Then we repeat the same experiment, uh, replacing the default Kubernetes scheduler with uh, PX scheduler. Uh, during these two scenarios, we calculate the, we collect the metrics uh, like uh, node utilization, energy efficiency metrics, and then compare how much is the uh, energy consumption during this experiment and uh, see if there is any uh, saving in the energy consumption using peaks. If that is the case, then that is attributed to the value of uh, peaks plugin. So this, this, this scheme of uh, evaluation is uh, uh, common across all the use cases that uh, I will take you through. And this is the uh, particular cluster setup on which we uh, demonstrated these use cases. But these use cases are generic enough to be able to uh, uh, carry out on uh, any cluster node with uh, any number of uh, uh, nodes and with any types of homogeneous or heterogeneous. Uh, only that the uh, amount of savings will differ. Okay, so let me jump into the uh, list of use cases that I would like to take you through. Uh, so this one is uh, the uh, most regular configuration when a party is being deployed uh, with the help of a Kubernetes scheduler. Second one is the scaling of a pod using horizontal pod auto scaler uh, and uh, using a cube cuttle scale that is uh, uh, another uh, very popular uh, CLI interface uh, uh, to operate on the different uh, API objects. And fourth one is migration of a pod via pod explicit eviction. And the fifth one is a much more generic case uh, that is a cluster autoscaler. We'll see more details in, of these uh, use cases, but this is the gist of the use cases that I would like to spend in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, the first uh, use case is a deployment of a pod uh, using Kubernetes scheduler. Uh, under this, uh, we considered the cluster uh, with the two nodes and uh, we assume there is no other uh, application or pod running on this uh, cluster. Um, and uh, only one pod is to be scheduled um, that belongs to our application. Um, and uh, that pod, when it is a scheduled using the default scheduler, because the default scheduler is not cognizant of the node's uh, efficiencies, it can place this object, uh, this pod on any of these nodes. So assume that it places this uh, Part on the node in a, uh, on the node which is energy inefficient. So, and if it runs for a while, about 10 minutes, uh, you can see that the node utilization of that uh, energy inefficient node um, is uh, uh, at some level. It is around 12 percentage. Uh, you could actually run a, a bigger workload, and the utilization can be much more higher. Then repeat the same experiment with uh, replacing the default uh, scheduler with. Uh, Peaks scheduler, but this time because peak scheduler is aware of the energy efficiencies of these nodes, it will choose the node N1, which is uh, most energy efficient in this case. So <clears throat> you can see the part uh, executing on this node. Again, it runs for uh, about the same uh, period, 10 minutes, right? And uh, 
uh, the right side uh, graph actually uh, depicts uh, the energy consumption of uh, the cluster across these two nodes over the time progresses. Now you can see that using the default scheduler, the uh, energy is consumed some, uh, some amount, and uh, with using peaks, the amount uh, of energy consumption is lesser. So there is a saving, the gap between these two graphs represents the saving in the uh, amount of uh, energy consumed by the cluster ac uh, across its all nodes. So uh, in this experiment, what we observed is the saving amounts to uh, roughly about 12 percentage. Uh, and points to note before I jump into the uh, other use case is that the energy savings can be more if you run this same experiment for longer duration, because uh, the uh, accumulation, um, accumulated energy over time uh, over time, we have some uh, portions of energy which gets accumulated over time, and hence, over time, if you run the workload for longer duration, you see more savings. So that's one thing. And second thing is because the uh, active energy for the uh, the high power machine here is very high. So the as the utilization of that node goes up, so. Here we are running these nodes at lower utilization. If you increase the utilization of these nodes, you would also see uh, higher savings. So there are two ways uh, for realizing higher savings. And uh, I would also like to uh, extrapolate the fact that if uh, these parts are running uh, on these clusters along with other applications as well, we can realize such a saving. Just for the sake of understanding the concept more easily, we, had, uh, we assumed the fact that there is no other application running at this time, but this can be uh, co-located or co-executing with other applications parts. The next use case is a scaling of uh, a part using a horizontal part autoscaler. So in this use case, actually, we have a uh, particular uh, uh, deployment. And uh, the deployment is configured with the um, horizontal part autoscaler. The particular uh, 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 CPU percentage here represents the fact that when the uh, resource utilization allocated for this part goes beyond the 50 percentage uh, limit, uh, then a new part is uh, uh, created by the HPA. Uh, and uh, we want to have minimum of one part at any time and a maximum of 30 parts uh, uh, to be configured by the HPA controller. And uh, <clears throat> when we do this experiment using the uh, default uh, peaks scheduler, so you can see that as the load increases, uh, then uh, the HPA controller uh, starts creating uh, more parts. And uh, uh, when the HPA controller wants to create a new part, uh, the placement of that part, the decision is made by the scheduler, uh, default scheduler. And uh, uh, because it's uh, not, uh, it, the, the default scheduler uh, does something called spreading of the parts on the nodes, right? So it uh, equally tries to uh, place these parts over the time. So during this experiment, uh, we created uh, about 15 parts, and those parts were alternatively being placed uh, between the nodes of this cluster. So you can see that the, at any point in time, almost the utilization across these, uh, these two nodes is at the same level, right? So, and uh, now uh, come, come back to the, um, the uh, peak scenario. When peaks is uh, uh, used for scheduling, uh, when the load increases, the HPA controller, horizontal part autoscaler controller, uh, does the same kind of uh, scaling that, uh, that it decides a new part to be created uh, as the load increases. But this time, the part placement is, uh, the decision is made by the uh, PIX uh, scheduler plugin. And uh, because PIX is aware of the you know, energy efficiency of nodes, it wants to first exhaust all the resources available on the uh, most energy efficient node. So it tries to keep the parts as much as possible on node one first. Okay, so you can see that the utilization of uh, node one goes all the way up to 100 percentage before a, a part is uh, uh, placed on the node two. Right, so initially the part um, the node one is uh, packed with uh, the parts, and then once the node one's all the resources are exhausted, then node two starts getting packed. 
right? So uh, this is the place where node two starts getting packed, and uh, you can see that at this level, node one uh, is at 100% utilization. Okay. Now you compare the uh, energy consumption of the cluster across these two nodes under these two scenarios. The orange line represents the energy consumption using the default uh, uh, scheduler plugin across these two nodes, uh, whereas the blue one represents the energy consumption across the uh, cluster nodes, uh, both the nodes, using the peaks. Uh, scheduler plugin. So you can see there is a gap between the uh, energy uh, consumption uh, over the period, right? So as the time progresses, the gap increases. Um, so this is because uh, while uh, time progresses actually in this uh, def uh, default scenario, we are using the more resources of uh, uh, node 2, which is energy inefficient, hence the gap is increasing. Now, there is another observation that you can make is that after a point here, the um, uh, gap starts decreasing. Why the blue curve starts growing up here is because uh, this represents the time scale, timeline where uh, using peaks, we started using the resources of node 2, which is energy inefficient. Right. So as long as this was not used, the gap was increasing uh, because we are uh, using under uh, uh, the default scenario resources of uh, node 2 in this. So hence, the, there is an increase in the gap. And uh, here, uh, uh, we started uh, uh, using the resources of node 2. Hence, the gap starts decreasing. So this demonstrates the fact that using uh, HPA, uh, horizontal power data scalar, with uh, a peaks plugin, you can still realize uh, energy savings. And uh, horizontal part auto scalar using a horizontal part auto scalar along with uh, uh, the deployment is a very common use case because HPA enables us uh, do scale up and scale down automatically. Right. So let me go to the uh, third use case. <clears throat> In the third use case, we see. Uh, the advantage of uh, peaks with uh, a very famous uh, um, uh, CLI that is cube cuttle scale. Uh, the cube cuttle scale actually interface uh, is helpful to scale up and scale down the parts of an application where the uh, API resources uh, are not just being the deployment resources, but they can be um, the stateful sets or uh, replication controller or replica set and so on. So there are a variety of uh, application uh, API objects that Kubernetes actually allows users uh, uh, to uh, work with. And uh, under uh, uh, this variety of uh, uh, API objects, uh, uh, to configure right, to scale up, scale down, this is the API. Now what happens, uh, let's see, with the, the default uh, uh, controller plugin. Uh, assume that we have a deployment uh, which has uh, two parts. Initially, assume that these two parts are uh, uh, deployed on node one. And because this is the most energy efficient, uh, assume that due to some scenario, uh, the nodes, the parts are initially placed on these nodes. Now. Uh, think that the application owner wants to scale up the number of parts from two to five. Now the new three parts, they are uh, scheduled by the default scheduler, uh, default Kubernetes scheduler on the node two, because default scheduler behaves uh, the thumb rule is uh, to uh, spread the nodes across the nodes, right? So it uh, places these uh, newly created parts on node 2, even though there is a space for uh, deploying these parts on node 1, which is more energy efficient, because it cannot simply do that. It is not aware of the energy efficiency of these nodes. Now, uh, on the other hand, if you uh, consider the scenario of a Peaks plugin, uh, consider that we have initially two nodes. And uh, uh, sorry, two parts which are deployed on the most energy efficient node. Uh, and now we are doing the same experiment. We are scaling up nodes, a number of parts from two to five. But this time, the new parts are deployed uh, on the uh, node one uh, because this deployment is uh, uh, handled by Peak's scheduler plugin and it is aware of the energy efficiency, right? So uh, uh, please note the fact that, um, okay. So maybe I will uh, go to the another uh, use case, migration of part. So this is the fourth use case where um, consider the scenario uh, where at any random time instance, uh, certain parts may be running 
on the uh, cluster nodes and uh, uh, assume that uh, at a given point in time, we, uh, we have an application running and its uh, two parts are running on two different nodes. But uh, you know that uh, the node one, Tantwai one, is more energy efficient. So uh, ideally you have two options here. You can let the um, application run as is and complete, or you can actually try to move this part from uh, node two to node one because node running on node one is more energy efficient. So if you try to delete that part manually, and uh, this time, uh, because the API object, uh, the replica set, uh, knows that a part of uh, this number of replicas is uh, deleted, it needs to create a new part. So it will try to create that part to meet the desired state of two uh, replicas. So but this time, uh, the part is again created on the same node because this uh, the underlying uh, uh, scheduler plugin is default. On the other hand, you repeat the same experiment with uh, Pix plugin. Assume that there is another application running which is uh, already consuming most of the resources of uh, energy efficient node, and uh, our particular application PHP Apache uh, is uh, uh, running with the two parts, one on node one and another one on node two. Uh, so, assume that after a while, the other application CPU stress test exits. Uh, so, when it terminates, uh, it uh, releases the resources allocated to this application. So, now we have the same scenario where uh, the either we can let this application run as is or try to see if we can move this part to the energy efficient node. So, this time, try again the same command, try to delete the part that is running on the uh, energy inefficient node. Uh, and this time again, replica set knows that one, one part is uh, uh, exiting, so it needs to create a new part. It tries to create that new part, and uh, now this time the scheduler plugin will try to allocate that on the energy efficient node. So this mimics the auto migration of uh, parts from energy inefficient nodes to energy efficient nodes. Uh, at random time periods, right? So this we have done it using a script, but it is always possible to um, uh, exercise the same behavior using um, um, some uh, automated scripts like uh, uh, jobs and uh, cron jobs and so on, right? Which can actually uh, be monitoring the energy, uh, the resource usage of uh, energy efficient nodes, if, and if they find that energy efficient nodes are any time underutilized, then they try to move. Um, workloads from energy inefficient nodes to energy efficient nodes automatically, right? So all this is possible to uh, automate. So the <clears throat> last use case that I want to uh, touch upon is uh, cl using cluster autoscaler. In the previous uh, use case, we have seen the scenario where uh, the parts corresponding to a given uh, deployment, we are trying to migrate. What if we want to do it uh, across all the deployments of a uh, of a cluster, right? Why can't we do it? So if we try to do that uh, across the cluster uh, uh, by trying to migrate all the parts running on the most energy inefficient node of the cluster to any other node of that cluster, then uh, ensure that the most energy inefficient node of that cluster is uh, um, uh, dried up of the parts, then the cluster autoscaler will identify that this is uh, underutilized and uh, automatically will uh, delete that part. Then by doing that, you are not only saving the active power. So by the way, when we do the uh, migration of a part, we are actually saving on the active power. But by shutting down the nodes, we are also saving on the idle power. And if you see these two graphs, uh, the idle when the node is any node you consider, any cluster node, when it is in idle state, it accounts for some energy, and which is also known as idle energy. And this is increasing in nature. Even if you just keep the uh, node idle, right? You, you think that, OK, my node is not doing any work. and uh, still it is consuming a lot of power and it is a significant portion of node's total power. So shutting down the node is one of the best ways to handle energy savings. So this is the use case that, uh, that demonstrates uh, shutting down node. So b b before I uh, move on the other aspects, let me, uh, because of the uh, time constraints, we are not actually doing a live demo, but uh, this is a uh, snip of the logs from the um, live cluster, 
where this demonstrates the fact that an incoming pod uh, is placed on a node which has less jump in energy consumption over a node which has uh, uh, more jump in the energy consumption. So that means that we are making the decision where the incoming pod is placed on a node such that the change in the cluster's energy consumption is lesser by making this decision, which is the wiser decision in our context. <coughs> Okay, though there are some FAQs. I will come to this slide later. Before that, uh, let me spend a couple of minutes on future work. For example, the part migration scenario that I explained, uh, we have demonstrated uh, energy savings possibility, uh, possibility with uh, uh, part migration, but uh, one can actually automate the same workflow that I explained using uh, automated scripts very easily. So that is one future work item for us, uh, uh, immediate on milestone for us. And shutting down the nodes to minimize the power consumption, again, this one, uh, the use case 5 that I have referred to is done uh, uh, using manually uh, running scripts, but uh, one can write uh, automated scripts to exercise the pod migration across the cluster and across the nodes <coughs> in an automated fashion. <clears throat> the next uh, enhancement possible is vertical pod autoscaler. We have seen that uh, with the use of HPA, horizontal pod autoscaler, there is a benefit uh, uh, in terms of energy savings. Uh, with, when it comes to VPA, uh, when VPA tries to scale up the resources allocated uh, on a, a node for a particular pod, you could actually um, make VPA more <coughs> energy uh, aware by enhancing the <coughs> by performing the scale up on those nodes which are energy efficient. When you want to uh, scale up the resources allocated for a pod using VPA, uh, today it does on any of these nodes without being aware of the energy efficiency, right? You could actually make the VPA aware of the energy efficiency and ensure that it scales up those parts running on most energy efficient nodes. So the another one is a cube cutter scale. Okay, I will not spend there much time. And the, here we have listed some of the related work. And uh, yeah, here are some of the repos. Uh, the first repo is where the plugin score uh, is implemented. So this repo, Peaks repo, is more for the project management. Um, and the last repo is the Kepler uh, uh, repository, which is one of the um, dependencies of our project. I'll hand it over to uh, uh, Parul. Yeah, before we get into the questions, just wanted to know that we are working on a cap that we'll be uh, creating with the Kubernetes sk uh, scheduling SIG. And so keep on monitoring our Peaks repository. And we also have a community meeting that happens once in a month. So uh, we are trying to build a community and we want more contributors. So if you have any suggestions, you want to participate in, in any discussions or you want to have present to us like a use case, please open a discussion or issue on our repository. And now we are open to a yeah, few acknowledgements, like Felix was not able to make it uh, to our session, but he has actively contributed and we also have a sir. So thank you to both of them. And now we are open for questions. Any questions? Yeah, so. Sure. No, Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, <coughs> getting the mic. <coughs> Hello, thank you for the presentation. Um, I saw the future slide at the end, and I'm uh, just asking, uh, could uh, where the power uh, is created, you know, because uh, it's, it's important to know where the electricity comes from, especially for the carbon, um, will peak, peaks take uh, in uh, consideration, sorry for my French English. Oh, so if I can rephrase, uh, you are uh, yeah. asking the fact that uh, during the energy efficiency, power uh, consumption minimization process, do we also consider the carbon efficiency? Uh, do you consider where uh, the nodes are running, uh, geologically uh, speaking? So if I got your question right, you are talking about do we also assign a value or like a priority if, depending on the source of energy, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. So we did dive into like we two years in 2022, we were working on the use case where we were trying to consider carbon as well as the source of electricity. 
but uh, we like our process to be very transparent and open source based, and it was very hard to get those data. Um, in Europe, they're still possible if you use electricity maps, but in US, uh, it's just very hard to get by. So just because we want our policies to be super transparent, that's why we, right now we are not working on that. We explored, but we are not. Uh, and, and just to add to what Parul said, uh, optimizing for energy efficiency and uh, carbon minimization are not exactly the same, right? And uh, there is a, a different talk uh, called Caspian uh, that is going to come tomorrow from the same group uh, that we belong to. Uh, please stay up to that uh, uh, session if you want to really know about carbon optimization. Yeah, so we have one more question. Yeah, sure. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, I noticed all the pods got scheduled to a single node. Uh, what happens if I have anti-affinity policy? Uh, does the scheduler respect that? Sure. So uh, because uh, the scheduler plugin um, follows the scheduler framework, so it does respect the pod affinity, anti-affinity, node labels, all these aspects. And if there are any such nodes filtered after these uh, 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 phases, only those nodes are considered. So this plugin respects the framework of uh, scheduling. At the beginning of your talk, you referred to like creating a profile for servers. Uh, would that be, would that profile be the same for the same configuration of server? Like if you create a rack where all the servers are the same? Not necessarily. Not oh, really? necessarily. Oh, that's because, uh, Why would that be? Yeah, because uh, even though the uh, hardware configuration may be same, but the applications running may be different. And different workloads may use different uh, amounts of resources of the uh, servers. Hence, uh, your uh, power modeling needs to be cognizant to the workload type that is going to run. And there's also two components to it. So either you can have like an offline model that you train once and then you don't revisit again. But you can also do like keep an online model where depending on the instantaneous or what is happening in the cluster at that moment, you keep on retraining your model. So it's very unlikely that two nodes will have identical node model profile. Uh, next person, yeah. So this is the last question, sorry. Okay, so I have two questions. Uh, you talked about creating model per node. Per node. When does this occur? What's the overhead currently creating this? So yeah, that's what we said. That that's a pre-processing uh, step. Let me just quickly go back to the slide. Yeah. So at the start, when you are just starting and you uh, when you have you haven't enabled the scheduling. So what you do is you just pre-process the node model for each of the nodes in the cluster. So that is pre-scheduling. But again, as I mentioned, there are two approach. You can have online or an offline. So for an offline, you just do it once. Uh, but for online, this process keeps on going on. And that's when you get the uh, model parameters using, for example, a webhook. OK, thanks. And second question. Um, the processor have power efficiency modes, and they can switch basically between uh, poor modes. And why do not did, did you try to leverage these features during your? Sorry, say that again. I don't. The, the poor modes, a, a CPU can uh, down clock and power. Yeah, yeah, that is called the DVF functionality. It. Uh, dynamic DVS functionality. Yeah, we, this can work with the DVFS, though in the use cases uh, we didn't uh, uh, include any particular use case with the DVFS, but definitely it should uh, work with the DVFS too. It's cognizant to uh, the frequency of the node. So, yeah, that's about it. And I'll just bring to the QR code. So, yeah, drop by in a community meeting, and we have a kiosk on Friday as well, 10:30 uh, to 12:30. So feel free to talk if you're interested in exploring the use case or start a discussion or whatever. Thank you so much. And also try to uh, provide your feedback by scanning this QR code. Thank you. Okay.